to, uh, on behalf of the staff of Revolution Books, I want to welcome everyone here tonight and uh, let you know we've been waiting a long time for Horace Campbell to come to Revolution Books. Um, Casa Hoon Chicole from Africa World Press can tell people about the repeated efforts that have been made to have him able to come to this country, and so this is uh, a privilege that he's able to be here. Um, it's an undeniable law of history that where there is oppression, there is resistance. And it is also true that this resistance takes many different and sometimes contradictory forms, including many different cultural forms. And just being here in the bookstore, uh, we get customers from all over the world. We get many people here from the English-speaking Caribbean. And also there are people that come here from the Horn of Africa. And very frequently, sometimes people from the Horn are people who themselves have participated in the revolution that toppled Haile Selassie. And uh, this was, um, um, in their view, Haile Selassie was someone who ruled Ethiopia in the interest of U.S. imperialism. And some of these people are very puzzled by something like Rastafarianism, which they, on the one hand, say, how is it possible that Rastas, who stand against the down, downpressers and preach liberation, how could Haile Selassie be a spiritual figure for these people? Well, we think this is an important question, but at the same time, we think that it's very crucial to understand the development and the significance of a rebellious movement like Rastafarianism. It was Walter Rodney who, in his book, Groundings with My Brothers, first examined Rastafarianism and its significance. And in Horace Campbell's book, Rasta and Resistance, he has gone much more deeply and comprehensively into a study of the Rastafarian movement from its evolution in the hills of Jamaica to the present manifestations in the streets of urban citadels in Birmingham and here in the US. And his work, what's very important about his work is how it highlights the quest for change among the oppressed people who have taken up Rastafarianism. People here should understand that the imperialist rulers of the US and their you know, puppets in Jamaica they certainly fear this movement and its influence. Aside from the ongoing murders of many reggae musicians, including the recent killing of Peter Tosh, there are increasing attacks and repression against Rasta communities. The US government, for example, has been using their so-called war on drugs to um, stage heavy clampdowns against a section of people that they feel are a quite unreliable section of the population. If you have people that are preaching, I'd rather be a free man in my grave than living as a puppet or a slave, these are not people that you're going to easily be able to count on you know, in a movement for resurgent America, for white God and uh, motherhood and country, and in their whole preparations for war. Now, um, Horace Campbell is a writer, a teacher, and a political activist who has taught in Africa, the Caribbean, Britain, and North America. His writings include two books, four essays on, on neocolonialism in Uganda, and Pan-Africanism, the struggle against neocolonialism and imperialism. Since 1981, he's been teaching at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And uh, as I said earlier, we're very pleased to have him here tonight and I'm proud to introduce Horace Campbell. Thank you. I think I want to stand a bit so I can even see some of my brothers and sisters in the back there. Good evening, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends and others. I would like to thank Revolution Books for organizing this evening where we could have this dialogue and discussion about some of the ideas that we're attempting to develop in Rasta and Resistance. I'd also like to thank, apart from Revolution Books, I'd like to thank um, Comrade Kasehun Chikole and the growing efforts of Africa World Press to be part of a growing intellectual culture of the African intelligentsia. Because we believe that the attempt 
to break with the reproduction and representation of knowledge about our people is as much an important part of our struggle as those who are there at the forefront of the struggle, either with guns or at the place of work or in the homes or in the fields. And right here in the city of New York, at the center of finance capital, to be in a building like this where one is surrounded by knowledge of struggles of peoples all over the world, one is of course encouraged because this is itself a reflection of day-to-day -day struggles that are going on in all parts of the world. Tonight, I'm not going to speak so much about struggle. I'm going to try to share with you some of my, 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 my reflections in trying to recreate what we did in Rastan resistance and why we felt that it was important and why this force, this social force, how we think it should be part of a break in reflecting on what we call the subjective element. Because for so long, we have been dealing with a certain culture, a certain political culture, a certain economic culture, a, a certain consciousness which comes out of Europe, which comes and is integrated in North America. And that culture is rooted with the whole process of capital accumulation to the point that in life, in death, in all, in all spheres of reproduction is reproduced. To the point that human beings are losing their sense of self-worth in the way in which the society reproduces itself today. So what we're looking at, social movements, consciousness, how they reproduce aspects of resistance and the limitations of that resistance the positive effects of that resistance and how it can take us forward out of this decade of reaction and destruction because that's what the decade that we are in. We are in one of the most serious challenges. The decade of Thatcher and Reagan and Botha and Pinochet is a decade where they're seeking to turn back the gains of the 20th century where oppressed peoples gained a certain experience in establishing the right to be independent. And I want us to reflect on how the Rastafari was part of that attempt to assert the independence of oppressed peoples. Rastafari is also part of the social movements of the 20th century. And I speak more and more of the 20th century because I, I, I get a sense in which we are in the transition to the 21st century. And when I look around in the youths, in those who we teach, I ask myself, what kind of ideas are we imparting for them to carry forward to the next century? What kind of traditions are we leaving with them? And so, as a social movement, what are the positive effects? What are the positive lessons of those social movements of the 20th century? One, one part of this world where African people are giving <coughs> positive lessons are in South Africa, and we have youths. 11, 12 year old youths who are incarcerated in South Africa and they, they, are not, they do not need to be told in books, they are gaining practical experience that they will carry to their children and that tradition I think is calling on humanity to take sides and I think many of you who are in this room have taken sides, I think your very presence here tells that you have taken sides and I think what I want to do is to, re to, to, to share with you and to reflect on how we can deepen the side that we take, how we can sharpen and how our reflection in this era um, can strengthen us as we go in our day-to-day -day task to face the new gods that are presented before us, the god of commodity fetishism, the god of money and materialism. And I think this is where I see Rastafari as making a profound contribution. Because Rastafari was a social movement which grew in contradiction to the crude materialism of the Jamaican society. What we have tried to do in Rastan resistance is something that I, I, I don't want to describe because in itself Rastan resistance is an attempt to make a break with a certain kind of scholarship in the Caribbean. What is considered scholarship? That is those who uh, had, the, had the opportunity to go to school, those who had the opportunity to lead and write. Going to school, reading and writing was a passport to escape from the working class. It was a passport 
to escape and participate or to be servants of those who oppress the working class. And what the new Caribbean intelligentsia, uh, with uh, which Walter Rodney was a generation, was handing down is that one should attempt to use one's skills not only at the level of how one approached the working class, but in terms of the tools one developed to be able to see the working people and the development of our people, the specific ways in which our people develop. What are the characteristics of our peoples? Why our people develop in a certain way? What kind of discipline, organization, consciousness? And this is what led us to study the working class in, in Jamaica and the manifestation in the form of Rastafari. A lot of the literature that came before us described things about the Rastafari. It went into the questions of locks, it went into the question of the Bible, it went into the Chilean pipe, it went into the ganja, reggae, and it went into images, and these images are important. These, they, they went into persons, but I think what we have to do, we have to understand much more than images. We have to understand why these images develop. What did these images reflect? Where did they come from? And where are these images? What were the people resisting? And if the resistance was able to be a hedge against total brutality and oppression, is that resistance capable of leading the society out of the present conditions that they face themselves? I think these are questions that we have to ask ourselves, and we hope that the body of literature which we th see developing in the Caribbean, in the Pan-African world, as part of the anti-imperialist literature, as part of a growing body of ideas calling on the development of a new society, we want to see our work as part of that tradition. Of course, in terms of reading and writing as a skill, I want to stress the class orientation of that because in the Caribbean and among African people, in slavery, the oral tradition was much stronger than the written tradition. The oral tradition, the traditions of handing down knowledge through example, through practical skills in the community, is a very important part of our tradition. So we have to understand that there's a distinction between the reproduction of knowledge at the formal level by those of us who have been to school and the reproduction of knowledge in the community by people through their day-to-day -day skills and tasks. And we haven't made that bridge yet because the educational system in our society have not able, been able to bridge that gap. The educational system still reflects the alienation of the kind of oppression that exists in our society. For a long time, the bridge between the reproduction of knowledge at the formal level and reproduction of knowledge among the people, the bridge between that had be, has been in the area of religion. That has been for a long time, because the spiritual world, the, 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 the way in which people reflect on the cosmology and what they see to be a higher form of existence than that of themselves, has always been dominant among our people. But in an attempt to interpret and understand that world, slowly during slavery, Christianity was one reference point, although African religious forms have always existed and continue to exist in the Caribbean and South America. One aspect of Christianity that was exposed to the Caribbean people and is the dominant aspect of Christianity is that which is written in the Bible. That is the English version of the Bible that we read. And so for a long time the Bible represented an uh, instrument through which knowledge got into the Caribbean community. The Bible became important for us as um, Caribbean people, as a reference point, as an area through which people could develop a language of deliverance. That is, even in the last election campaign in Jamaica in 1980, the major campaign, um, the opposition leader, I'm sorry, the present prime minister, developed a language called deliverance. It, it shows in the consciousness of the Jamaican people, the idea of escaping from bondage is so much a part of their consciousness. But we have to see how these ideas have been taken over and manipulated. But let's go back to look at some of the roots of this idea of deliverance. The idea of being 
um, able to escape from bondage and how the Bible um, was interpreted and used as an ide ideological tool. The Rastafari chose a certain interpretation of Western religion, a certain interpretation of Christianity to be their spiritual guide. I say Western because ultimately the Rastafari in the West and we become more and more conscious of the limits of Western religions and, 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 and some of the arrogance that Western religions arrogate to themselves. We become more and more conscious of it the more we expose to the history of human civilizations. So I want to, 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 to reassert this fear that the, the Rastafari in struggling against a Western concept of oppression finds themselves in dealing with Christianity as it was handed down. But in, in an attempt to deal with that Christianity, they held on to Ethiopian variant of Christianity as it was represented in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Now, this, this was a profound break because this religious controversy between the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Christian Church in the West is not a mean contradiction. It has to do with a conception of the divinity of man and the divinity of God. And this is for one reason why the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is still not a member of the World Council of Churches. For a long time, for a long time, blacks in Africa identified with this Ethiopian church so that the Rastafari in Jamaica was only one part of a wider, of a wider attempt at what is called self-definition. In other words, Ethiopianism would have preceded the Pan-African form of Rastafari, where, where the Bible and identifying with the Bible was a way in which people identify with different, different verses in the Bible, different, for example, this verse, princes come out of Egypt, Ethiopia stretches forth her hands to God, has been quoted in, from pulpits in North America, all over the world, and the Ethiopian church in South Africa for a long time was a very important church. So in order to situate the Rastafari movement, we should see it not as a movement simply developing in Jamaica, but to see the international strands in the way in which race, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a idea, taking root among humanity in the past 500 years, was having its expression in religious form. Now, Jamaica society reflects probably the most um, lopsided version of this thing called race. Because, you know, we, um, we are so dominated in North America and Western Europe by this thing called, called race, because it's such an active part of the domination and exploitation of people. It's, it's, so, it's so active in the, in the consciousness of man that it, it, it holds back even the human potential because the society is so constrained by the whole, the whole attempt to reify this concept of race, that this human potential, that at the level of technology, at the level of science, we've had so many breakthroughs, but all these breakthroughs in elaborating a framework for the emancipation of the human being it's been constrained by this idea of inferiority and superiority based on race something that is very unscientific which has been developed in our view in the past 500 years and centralized for the oppression of non-white people the fact is that the 20th century has been bedogged by the struggles defined within a context of race, and the Rastafari emerges as one of those movements in the 20th century. Garvism, in my work, is seen as a central aspect of that movement. And I think in this year, the 100th year of Marcus Garvey, we need to reflect some more on the work of Marcus Garvey. I'm very happy to see that there has been a new attempt to define and to reappraise the work of Marcus Garvey, and there have been uh, a spate of celebrations. I recently participated myself in a celebration on Marcus Garvey in Jamaica. And I think the question of African redemption, the question of uh, liberation of Africa, what was significant about Garveyism in its difference from every other movement this century is its ability to organize the most oppressed section of the working class and the black working class. That is, it, the 
is understanding in the way in which capitalism isolates and separates sections of the black working class from another in order to use one section of the working class as a social sanction against the next. And his ability to move through that, to develop an international movement, is something that has not been matched yet this century. Garveyism, uh, Garveyism, however, attempted to struggle against the question of racial domination within the context of the the organization of society that was established by the bourgeoisie. In other words, at the time the Garvey movement and Garveyism developed, it was still operating within the consciousness of building kingdoms, building commercial enterprises to struggle against the capitalists on the same basis as the capitalists. This was a limitation of the movement at a particular historical moment, and I'm certainly hoping that we would have learned some of the lessons from that movement. Garvey, Garveyism also was significant in the self-organization. I want to stress this, the self-organization of the, the, the working masses. That is, the working masses were then getting their own experience. I want to, I want to underline this because um, since the era of nationalist politics in the Caribbean and in Africa, even in North America, since the period of the civil rights movement, so many of our young people are losing the experience that has been accumulated in our communities in organizing, in building, in struggling. And I think that experience is a tradition that needs to be reasserted, needs to be written about. And I think there is, a, there is in this period of reaction, this period of the, the capitalist crisis, for us to draw inspiration for Marcus Garvey and those experiences of struggle. Now, Garveyism laid the foundations for some of the fundamental principles which guided the Rastafari movement. But we wanted to look at Garveyism and the Rastafari movement not in the context of one individual um, like Marcus Garvey or Leonard Howell. And I was speaking to someone today who was saying one criticism he would make of my book is that I did not develop into greater detail the ideas of Leonard Howell and the commune that was built in Pinnacle and how that commune could have acted as a reference point which was different from the plantation of the society. And I said, that is possible, and it is important that those who want to write about Leonard Howell do so. But I was attempting to capture the force and the spirit of this movement as a totality, and to see the social conditions which gave rise to this movement. This, this we are, have attempted to do. We, we will not yet know how successful we have been at this. What is important is that the Rastafari as a movement that developed in the 1930s, uh, developed in the struggle against colonialism, developed in identifying with Ethiopia as an independent African state, that form of resistance in the 1930s could not take the peoples forward. But what it did, it was an important reference point for rebellion and resistance. Now, in the 1930s, the Caribbean mass movement, but for the first time since slavery, built a movement that was capable of shaking the colonial foundations. And I think more work needs to be done on specifying the conditions of the working class, why it gave to rise to Rastafari in the way it did, and why the working class, as a class, throughout the Caribbean, whether it was in Jamaica, or Trinidad, or Guyana, or Antigua, could not give its own leadership to the nationalist movement. Why it is that the nationalist movement in all these territories produce uh, what we call middle class politics, produce middle class and petty bourgeois leadership. 
the Marxists in the Caribbean have not yet developed their own analysis of this because it is my view that we have not really had a Marxist tradition in the Caribbean. In, in, in fact, what we have are people who have read Marxism, but they have not been a materialist tradition in the society, which looks at the roots of the society, the development of the society, to be able to understand the formation of classes, consciousness, and struggles as it developed out of the specific history of our society. We have had one important breakthrough in this development in the work of the recent work of Walter Rodney, The History of Guyanese Working Peoples, and this work is still not yet widely developed. It, it is a work which I think has laid the foundation for the development of subsequent work. I think such kind of work is important in understanding why the Rastafari as a movement flowered again in the 1950s and 60s and why as a cultural, political, social, religious movement it took the main form of working class struggles in the Caribbean in the 60s and the 70s. I think this is a history that many of you will have known about. And I think what is important for us in developing our understanding of the Caribbean society, in developing our understanding of, 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 of the Rastafari movement, is to more and more begin to understand its potentialities, its contribution, and some of its limitations. I've been living on the African continent for the past six years. And one of the things I'm struck by is the way in which a social movement which developed in the Caribbean, using Africa as its reference point, has had such a profound impact on urban youths in Africa to the point that these youths in Africa started to look on the Rastafari as the most important movement for cultural reference points. It seems to me, it suggests that there is a weakness in the political movement in Africa. It seems to me there is a weakness in those who take onto themselves the task of political leadership so that the youth who are growing up in many of these societies in seeking to identify with forces of resistance, forces that want a different kind of society than catching up with Europe, than having more motor cars and more television, look to the Rastafari movement. And I, I, I was li I've been fortunate to be in the Ivory Coast and to see the impact of the work of Alpha Blondie and to see that here in the Ivory Coast, a society that reproduces some of the racial differences of Jamaica, some of the same colonial legacies that Alpha Blondie has developed a particular form of reggae, because for a long time we thought reggae came out of the specificities of slavery in the Caribbean. But to hear the reggae of Alpha Blondie and the, the, the way in which it is, it is circulated in West Africa, it's a, it's a brand of reggae which is fast developing on the continent of Africa. Of course, in South Africa, reggae and Rastafari would not have the same impact as it's having in the rest of Africa because there, there is a reference point, there, there is a social movement, there the youth is organized and is involved in political struggle. And, and the point is, there they do not have to deal with the psychological warfare that comes from Hollywood, the psychological warfare where Reaganism is, tried to, is transformed into Ramboism. The point is, the crisis in the, of the period that we live in is the young people, the youths, are looking for answers beyond the emptiness of the social glitter around them. All around us, we see what are supposed to be the examples of the success of capitalism. But beneath the surface of the success of capitalism, beneath the social glitter, beneath the stars and glamour of Dallas, or beneath the glamour of, what's the other one? Is it called? Dynasty. Dynasty. We see a certain <laughs> emptiness 
a certain alienation, a certain void in the human spirit. And Rastafari was one attempt to, to, um, to fill that void. It, it's an attempt which, though incomplete, represents an important hedge against the destruction of the human spirit, what we call the lobotomization of 1984, where human beings is turned into mindless objects in human beings. And this represents a major ideological struggle at the point we are. Many of you, I live in Africa and I live in a society where we have so much food that the food are rotting in the villages. You go to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe have a million tons of excess grain that they cannot sell. And I come to North America and the first image that we see in North America are that of poor starving children in Africa. And that represents part of the psychological warfare, part of the falsification of what the, the imagery of Africa is supposed to represent. Not that they are not starving children in Africa. They are starving children, but one has to understand what gave rise to that starvation, what kind of society export millions of tons of coffee to import arms which gives rise to famine in their society. That famine does not arise because of some god, um, some, some, some problem of nature. Famine does not arise because of the helplessness of Africa, but to locate it as part of the crisis of the period in which we live. I'm not in any way belittling the humanitarian efforts that arise out of social movements in North America because some of us saw the efforts of progressive organizations and humanitarian organizations. But we feel these efforts should be matched at the same time by a link to an understanding of the relationship between regimes in the society that use food as a weapon against their own people. Anyhow, we believe that the question of Africa, the question of the independence of Africa, remains central to the whole recomposition of capitalism. Yes, so we understand it. You talk about a capitalist crisis and a capitalist crash. In 1929, this crash, we saw bankers jumping out of the windows and we hear of banks. Um, going in bankruptcy. When we look at 1970s and 1980s, and we see the way in which there is the conscious attempt to transfer the burden of the crisis onto the children of Peru, onto the working mothers of Mexico, onto the people of South Africa and Angola. So the destruction and the reaction that we feel in the 80s in the third world is an integral, as integral a part of the crisis as the Wall Street crash on 1929. But we have to see these divisions and understanding of what's going on in the world around us in a real connection so that there's no disjointedness in how we then understand how we move forward. The way forward must also be part of an understanding of the contradictions which we face in our societies. Of course, in our work in Rastan resistance, we try to show that the Rastafari movement itself arose out of the major contradiction of Jamaican society, the contradiction of race, the contradiction of exploitation, and all the series of alienation which arises out of, out of capitalism. The alienation based on the, ali the, the alienation of the, the labor product of human beings, the alienation which is based on race, the alienation between town and country, the alienation based on sexual division of labor. We attempted to see these divisions as creating the Rastafari. But the Rastafari, in con confronting that society, has built up other contradictions. And one of the contradictions in the society is it's holding on to an African king. And the question that was raised in the introduction, why is it in a society such as Jamaica, where the Rastafari is supposed to be a progressive anti-imperialist movement, why would it want to hold on to the imagery <coughs> of Hale Selassie in Ethiopia? I think that's an important question to ask. But I think when one asks this question, one should also ask the question, if 
the Rastafari is holding on to Hill Selassie in Ethiopia? Why does the Jamaican state hold on to the idea of Queen Elizabeth as a head of state? <laughs> And I think it is then that you can understand why the Rastafari continue to hold on to the idea of Hail Selassie as a king. Because the alienation of monarchism in the society, where the state itself is organized around the idea of a head of state, the black people in Jamaica are saying, well, if you can hold on to a reactionary British monarch, why can't we hold on to our African monarch? And I think what we have to do in struggling with our brothers and sisters is to break the idea of monarchy, the idea of kingdom. And one of the period of nationalism, one of the period of pan-Africanism, what we did in the literature was to speak about African kingdoms, uh, whether it was Egypt or Zimbabwe or Ghana. But we did not speak of the Africa, of the villages, of the peasants, the workers, the craftsmen, the women. And I think it is part of the development of the work we do which can break that kind of view of monarchy so that we do not look simply at the Rastafari movement as a movement but to locate these contradictions and to see why they developed as they do. The other contradiction that we see is a contradiction in the way in which the Jamaican society, thank you, reproduces itself. Because when we look at any movement like the Rastafari, it undoubtedly develops symbols. Develops symbols around which there could, be, there could be ideas about what it represents. And many writers have said things about the colors of the Rastafari, about the, about the, the locks or about the beard. But I think symbols are themselves a reflection of something much more profound. I want to say something, however, about ganja and the Rastafari, what is called marijuana in this society. I want to say something about this as a contradiction. Because I, I, I think we need to look at this and to understand why ganja became part of a popular culture in the Caribbean and the relationship between, say, the attempt to exploit the development of ganja as a popular culture, part of the popular culture, and how that is part of international capitalist accumulation now. In other words, to make a distinction of the use of marijuana or ganja among the Rastafari and the commercialization and the internationalization of the trade in ganja and what this means in terms of social repression in the Caribbean. In our book, The Rastan Resistance, we made a connection between the, the historical use of cola nuts in West Africa and how when the Afro-Portuguese saw the centrality of cola nuts in spiritual communication among West African communities, how the cola nut trade was taken over as a prerequisite to the taking over of the slave trade and the establishment and building up the slave trade along the lines of the cola nut trade. Now, what we've seen in the Caribbean, not only in Jamaica, but throughout the Eastern Caribbean, is how the use and the farming of marijuana by small farmers and its use for religious, spiritual, or purposes of relaxation among the working class and the peasantry. How the state has used its laws against the working class in the, in, the, uh, in the dangerous drugs law and how that has been linked up with the internationalization and what I say the commercialization of, 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 of marijuana. The reggae artists have spoken to the question of the legalization, in other words, to take the, the whole question of the use of marijuana out of the subculture of of, of violence and criminality and I think those of us who speak about the Rastafari should also raise our voice about legalizing because it is part of making a distinction between the use of marijuana among the working class and the internationalization of this trade because what has happened in the Caribbean is when the state felt 
that could no longer control the, Gan the, 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 the Rastafari movement. After seeking to repress the movement, cut the locks of the brethren, isolate them, turn sociologists on them to call them cultists and escapists, then the state then turned into this new phenomena of the international trade in ganja. One, one, one must make a distinction between, because the way the trade in ganja is carried out between North America, the Caribbean and South America is very different from the capabilities of the small farmers who are involved in ganja in the Caribbean. What is more significant is the way in which the linkages between members of the lumping elements in the Caribbean, members of the unemployed who have been used against the working class, the way that whole infrastructure has been built up for something even more pernicious in the Caribbean. Because whereas the small farmers in Jamaica or big farmers can say they have some control over the planting and reaping of marijuana, they cannot say, they cannot say the same thing about cocaine. They cannot say the same thing about the relationship and circulation of cocaine. Now, from time to time, we hear about campaigns by the state against cocaine. And we wonder to what extent the state attempts to, 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 to fool itself or to con confuse the masses. The cocaine trade, as far as we understand from congressional records, now grosses over $80 billion for this economy. And the banking system in this society now is involved in the laundering of billions and billions of that trade because it now surpasses the machine tool industry in terms of its contribution to the economy of this society. Now, can it be said that such a trade is in the hands of elements from among the working class or the criminal elements that the state says it, it, that is out somehow? The point, we, the point we, are, we are trying to make is that in this crisis of capitalism, the state, through, through its way of turning the ideas of the people, they always seek through repressive tolerance to take progressive ideas from the people, to take elements of the popular culture, to turn it against the people. We have to, at all times, see the contradictions to see the problems among a movement like the Rastafari to, so that our brethren can themselves take part in the struggles. And I remember in Grenada that one of the ways in which the um, elements that were hostile to the Grenadian Revolution at one time tried to organize young brethren around the question of the herb. Of course, um, we need to look at experiments like the Grenadian Revolution and learn some of the lessons from the Grenadian Revolution. What was the relationship of the Grenadian Revolution to the Rastafari movement? I think they taught us many lessons, and I think the Grenadian Revolution itself, in its subsequent, uh, in its subsequent demise, have a lot to teach us. The other contradiction I think we have to learn from the Rastafari is the whole relationship between men and women, and the way in which the Rastafari seeks interpretation of the Bible to locate the place of women. This contradiction is not a contradiction of the Rastafari, it's a contradiction of the society from which they come. It's a contradiction of the relationships that have been developed and how these relationships develop as part of the culture and how one breaks that culture. In, 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 in my own work, I felt that this is something that is inadequately developed. And the inadequacy stems from the way in which our society have not yet developed the tools to see the kind of changes that are required in the labor process to deal with the contradiction of the repression of women. Where I live in Africa, imperialism has taken on the question of women. And every time imperialism is coming to Africa, they have a new program for women because they now speak in the name of women. But what we see, is that all these programs are geared for the deepening and the intensification of capitalism in Africa. So if in one country we have men that are planting cotton, you develop programs to give some aid to women so they can become efficient planters of cotton. In other words, how to integrate and deepen capitalism 
through closer integration of women. So the whole question of women's liberation is turned into the deepening and strengthening of capitalism. And I think a body of literature among progressive women has not developed enough to challenge that direction. And I think this is part of the weakness of the intellectual culture of the period in which we live. Of course, it's the weakness in our own work. And when I hear many brethren criticize the Rastafari brethren, I say that this criticism is valid, but there must be leadership coming not only from among the Rastafari, but from all elements, especially those elements who consider themselves taking the intellectual leadership in society. Out of these contradictions, we have to ask ourselves, how do we move forward? What kind of social movement do we develop? What are the lessons from this period? And how do we draw the positive lessons for us to move forward? What, how do we retreat, if necessary, without falling apart? And how do, we, how do we attempt to build a new base for building up the kind of social movement, the kind of ideas, the kind of ideas, the kind of organization, the kind of spirit that can take us to the next century? As I said earlier, I've been meeting um, Rastafari. In, in South Africa, I was pleasantly surprised, and I'm communicating with this group that is in Cape Town. What, what I'm saying is that in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, the Rastafari movement as a movement obviously has not been able to take the political leadership. For a while in the 1970s, there was the articulation of democratic socialism, there was the articulation of an idea <coughs> of what is called Marxism, but this idea did not entrust political organization, did not entrust any confidence in the masses of the people, and this idea could not confront American imperialism. Many of us blame imperialism for what happened in the Caribbean, both in Grenada and in Jamaica, and I think while it is correct to blame imperialism, we have to understand that imperialism is a factor that one has to contend with. The question is, how do we build our basis of support among the masses in such a way that any confrontation with imperialism will deliver blows to imperialism? I think this is a task we have to raise before us in this period. And it, it, it constrains us to have some more humility on the kind of social movement, the kind of organization, and to break some of the old conceptions of politics, of leaderism, of vanguardism that we have inherited from the past. And I think this is one of the major tasks before us. And this task, we feel that the, the, the consciousness of our people would tell us that revolution and social change does not come from the consciousness of the intellectuals. But that consciousness of the masses, the consciousness of the masses as it is reproduced in methods of the reproduction of knowledge in the society, must be merged in how the reproduction of knowledge is with the reproduction of society and the organization of the people where they work, where they live, in their communities for dignity, for livelihood for the basic rights, and I'm saying that this society promised in North America, this society promised to carry the leadership of the capitalist world, this leadership is increasingly called in question. I was surprised, I come from Africa and I live in Tanzania where the conditions where we live in is, is quite, um, quite deplorable, I'm saying that the basic reproduction, questions like water, housing and health. You know, the society has made a commitment to these things, and, but international capitalism says, how can you make a commitment to providing housing for the people when you're such a poor society? And when I come to New York City, the first thing that strikes me when I walk through the Port Authority is the amount of people sleeping in the Port Authority. Said I've never seen so many homeless people in this city in the many more than 20 years that I've been coming to this city. So what?
kind of organization? What forms of association are we promising? I think Rastafari remains relevant as long as the ideas of capitalism is supported by the ideas of superiority and inferiority. It remains relevant and our task is to see the relevance and how that relevance can be linked up to a social movement and where that social movement is to be based. As member of the intelligentsia, I hope that our work can be part of, part of a new intellectual culture for the youth to carry the mantle forward, to carry a social movement in the 21st century to break capitalism in the form that we have it now. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. um, I want to take questions and, and comments that people have tonight, what Cora spoke to and other stuff. Um, I'm curious, toward the, uh, the end of your comments, you said that you see a place for Rastafari so long as uh, the contradictions of capitalism uh, exist or prevail. Um, I know it's difficult to foresee into the future. Yeah. What part do you see Rastafari play in a society without the contradictions of capitalism? I see. Well, a society without the contradictions of capitalism, which survives with the contradictions of racism, will produce Rastafari. Because the Rastafari is not only a, a, a force which is dealing with capitalism, it's dealing with racial capitalism. And one will struggle to change the institutions of capitalism, to change the nature of capital reproduction. But, you see, um, one of the things about society is one can change organization of production. Yes? One can change um, and make scientific changes, but things that are in men's head will take many years. For example, Britain has been a capitalist country for more than 300 years, but they still have feudal ideas about monarchy in their heads. They still have feudal ideas about lords and, and, and peers in their heads. So we believe that even in a socialist society, that people will still have in their heads some of the, the legacies of, of, of racism, some of the legacies of white inferiority, black inferiority, or some of the, the alienation that has been developed in our society. And I, and I believe that there must be conscious struggles against these, that these are not only on the material plane, it's also on the ideological plane. And Rastafari was one ideological, one manifestation, one ideological struggle. When you were dealing with monarchs, I believe that you might have been saying something similar to how Haley Selassie became a leader of the Nyanzengi and it became less of a community and a cultural sort of um, shared thing and more of a leader coming in and taking this in another direction. Is that what you mean? Are you saying that we need to, in the future, move back to more of a uh, group-oriented, naive type situation, rather than having a strong leader that can, at a time, be beheaded and therefore lose the power of that naive baby itself, you know, due to there being, you know, confusions and power struggles later as that been beheaded. Okay. Uh, this thing about naive baby. It's, in, it's interesting how it has taken such a strong root among the Caribbean people. Uh, Naibingi, by the way, has very little, has nothing to do with Ethiopia. The Naibingi movement is a movement that came out of East Africa, and specifically out of Uganda, a place called Kigezi. And up to today, Naibingi is still identified as an anti-state, anti-colonial movement. The Naibingi movement, and this is something which we have to pay more and more attention to. The way spiritual understanding of the world 
consciousness, which what some people call idealism, have a place among the people. And that being the movement developed around some African religious tradition to be able to organize the people, and it is very much grounded in the in the in the community and in the people's conception of herbs, nature, and their ability to deal with nature. And the Rastafari, by identifying with Nyabingi, was identifying with the anti-colonial force. What I am saying is that <coughs> movements such as the Nyabingi movement, I think the Rastafari um, took ins inspiration from the Nyabingi. Now, the question of Hill Selassie is important, and, and to me it is curious. <coughs> How it is that the Rastafari had such a major identification in Jamaica in particular in the 1970s and the 80s? Why was that always so? Now, I grew up in the 50s in Jamaica. And when I was growing up among, among the Rastafari brethren, Hail Selassie was, was hailed as a major African leader like Lumumba. Nkuma, Nasa, if you remember um, 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 Bonnie Willis sang a song on, on, on um, Patrice Lumumba in the early, um, in the late 60s. It would seem to me that the Jamaican state, after Hill Selassie's visit in 1966, the Jamaican state that was always very cautious and nervous about any kind of African identification saw that, well, it's okay if these people identified with Ethiopia. So that the, the, they saw the contradictions in Ethiopian society was not in fact a threat to the status quo in, in Jamaica. And, and I believe it is not an unconscious effort to continue to specify and stress the relationship of the Rastafari to Hill Selassie. When the Rastafari movement in its origins, in the in the the ideas which gave rise to it was much more profound than his Lassie, although his Lassie played an important part as a reference point in 1930 and 1935. Any other questions? <coughs> okay. First year, and then I guess. Yeah. How, or, or I should say, what Rastafarian symbols are used in Jamaica by the political parties, the, the uh, JLP, the PNP, and the WPJ? How are they used, and what, what symbols are used? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult for me to speak on this, uh, because there are people in the audience that might know more about this than I do. I haven't been living in Jamaica for the past six years at least. For the past 10 years I haven't lived there on any consistent basis. From what I know, all the political parties use the symbols of the Rastafari. Well, let's, um, let's take something which is much more profound than a symbol, the Rastafari song. The Rastafari song has become the song of Jamaica, although the Jamaican state has not yet recognized the Rastafari song as the song of Jamaica, it is still the song of the Jamaican people. Reggae is used by all political parties in election campaign. The, um, the, the symbols uh, which, which the Rastafari speak to, uh, deliverance, the symbols of, um, of, um, of um, uprising, the symbols of beating down down pressure. One of, the, one of the, the most vivid examples was in 1972 when Michael Manley was campaigning, when he took this rod and said this rod he got mm -hmm. from Hill Selassie and it was a rod to strike down Pharaoh. This was the most vivid example. It was, it was, in my view, exploiting the symbolism and the idealism of the working class to the hilt. And it's, this is why I speak about these leaders, because Michael Manley rode on the bandwagon of the working class and yet something like the dangerous jobs law, which was used to oppress the working class, he retreated from dealing firmly. When other social democratic states in Holland, the, the laws um, uh, over marijuana have gone much further than the laws in, in Jamaica, where it's, it's much more widely used. Now, Edward Siaga is, um, is, is, is probably 
is probably a master at this thing. Because um, some of you don't know that when Edward Siaga was in university, he studied, uh, he made a study of working class religions in Jamaica. That is how he began his political career, um, studying the, the, the consciousness of the working people. And Edward Siaga, one of the things, he may not, he may not work uh, specifically with the Rastafari movement, but my understanding is those people who are involved in what is called born again religion now, this is um, a phenomenon of reaction of the <coughs> 80s, he has used it very significantly. The question in my mind is not the use of these symbols. The question in my mind is how can a progressive leadership see the importance of these symbols and yet to draw the positive lessons from them and to separate it from the negative lessons and have the courage to do so. Many times I've, I've, I've been in Jamaica and I've stood before audiences and I've spoken about conditions in Africa and Rastafari Bertrand say, is it true that Hill Selassie is dead? Yes, I say yes, as far as I know, he died in 1975 and he was about to How do you mean to say that? In other words, many people who are in the left movement do not have the courage to tell the Bridging the truth. Uh, let me give you another example that the left movement has retreated from. In, in Jamaica, there is the whole question of Pan-Africanism and the question of the centrality of Ethiopia to the, uh, to the Rastafari movement. But Ethiopia, the, the Ethiopian political leadership, whether on the Il Selassie, on the present military leadership, is carrying out repression of the people. And I think what one has to do is to explain the realities so that the Jamaican masses can identify with different aspects of the struggles in different parts of Ethiopia and Eritrea. And I think this is the task of revolutionaries, not to tail behind the masses, but to be able to use their knowledge and understanding. And I think this is what distinguished Walter Rodney in his grounding with his brothers. Because while he was with the Rastafari and he spent his time among them, he did not, he did not shirk from explaining the realities of what the social dis distinctions were in Africa. And I think this is the failing of the political movements in Jamaica, precisely because they don't want to break the mold of the politics that they find themselves in at the present. There's someone in the back. Yeah, I don't know, because I remember the exactly word that you said, but I think you mentioned the project. And we are yet to develop to understand the working class in the Caribbean. But at the same time, at the same time, we talk about Marcus Garvey, right? Uh, I don't understand how is it that we yet we have to develop a, a profound understanding of the working class. Even the fact that Marcus Garvey. Uh, travel the length and breadth throughout the Caribbean, Central America, even was uh, the head of a union, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, understanding the, um, the working class and how we have been exploited right, by Britain and what have you, I'm putting it short, so that he organized one, of, it becomes a phenomenon in terms of how we organize people and impact it throughout the world, all right? And even give people a kind of a identity once more, a reborn again Africa, if you prefer that way, to identify Africa as their homeland. But it would seem to me that any kind of a social uh, analysis dealing specifically with, with, with the working class must come through the black Marxist intellectual for a certain amount of recognition. And I think we have to begin to develop the mental capacity or develop the kind of a intellectualism on the basis that we can be able to do something without having to show some sort of a relationship, intellectual relationship of another sort of God that we prostrate ourselves in front of rather than dealing with intellectuals who never, who fought 
the colonialists long before the birth of Marx. But we seem to run into that problem. That is only when we are able to, to analyze something, it must rest on the basis of the, Mar the black Marxist intellectual and totally isolate brothers like um, this man who was born in Trinidad here, uh, born in Grenada, who organized the masses of black people here. No, no, no. Um, Butler. Butler. I think that the, in, the African intellectuals now should have no obligation in terms of Marxists, but begin to develop ideas and thoughts. You understand what I'm saying? That show the amount of respect and advance these ideas of our leaders, like Mark, like um, um, what's this guy name who died in, in Jamaica? There, uh, I forget his name now. Yes, is a uh, oh man. I, anyway, I can't recall his name. But these people seem to be relegated, as far as our intellectualism are concerned. But but it must be that in order to have this recognition. Marcus Garvey must take a, a tertiary position. Uh, Bookman from, uh, from, uh, from Haiti must take a secondary position in order to be recognized by the new, the new trust of black intellectuali intellectualism based on Marxism. I can't understand that. Mm -hmm. uh. I'm not sure how I can respond to that. Let me respond to the first part of your question about the working class. And I, um, I will see how that links up to the second part of the question about blacks and meeting the Marxist challenge. Okay? I will, I will try to do, I will try to do, um, do both. Because I think both are linked up in a sense. Obviously, the concept of class and the way we understand class in the Caribbean has been linked to a Marxist tradition. And that tradition is interpreting the relationships in society around the production process. One of the reasons why I say that we have not developed a concept of the working class is precisely because <coughs> I felt that the relationships of classes in the Caribbean has not evolved and developed similar to the working class in Europe or North America. And precisely because the nature of capitalism, either in its plantation form or its commercial form or the form of multinational capitalism that it takes in the Caribbean at present, it mutilates, isolates, distorts our working class and, and it, it's for that reason why I felt one of the one of the important works that we have before us is the work of Rodney and it is significant that Rodney titles his book The History of the Guyanese Working People to be able to see how the people as a whole give rise to different multi class phenomena among the oppressed classes. Why working people spend part of their time as peasants and sell their labor time because of the seasonal la nature of labor, etc. Well, what I am saying, in fact, is that some of the specificities of our societies, whether they are Marxists or non-Marxists, we have not yet um, we have not yet done a coherent and concrete study about our societies. That is what the first point. Now, this has to do with Marxism, yes. It has to do with Marxism insofar as Marxism ascribes to itself the task of developing a scientific, uh, scientific understanding of society. But one of the weaknesses of, of, of Caribbean Marxists and some of the, the Marxist movement in the Caribbean is that they, they have not developed their concept of Marxism from Caribbean history. Now, this weakness should in no way allow us to deny the importance of the study of science or Marxism. Because in many cases, we have, um, we have some of our people who, who neglect or turn their back on a scientific interpretation of the world. And I think a scientific interpretation of the world is not 
limited to Marx. It, it is an interpretation that is important for our understanding of the world, for our understanding of the kind of understanding of society to be able to lead us to the organization because the understanding is not simple. When we talk about the working class, we're not talking about it as an abstract phenomenon. We're speaking about it in terms of the ability of people who associate either around production or culturally or in their community. How the organization of people can change the power relationships in society. So it's not an abstraction. And obviously the working class in the society in the Caribbean have not had either the study or the kind of organization where they can change the power relationships in society. And I think this is part of the search of any social movement in the Caribbean or anywhere in the world at this moment. Yeah, let me interject here for a moment. You know, because I'm grounded with my brother here. Let me interject. <laughs> right? What it would seem to me is this, that having Marx develop this question, this, this theory that deals with um, work organization, all right? It would seem to me that we would have been primitive in our thoughts. I'm saying to you that here is a man called Garvey, all right? Here are people who see to it that they can develop a certain form of ideas and philosophy that has nothing to do with Europe, okay? And impacting on the world. And it is to say that, well, here's the people who scattered, you know, fragmentized, and we are waiting for a Messiah to deal with us from a scientific point of view, as if to say, well, we, we do not have the capability to, de to understand the social structure from a scientific basis, so we have to sit and wait until somebody develops thoughts and idea from over. It may seem again to me that we are not followers. We are not leaders, but followers. You see what I'm saying? I, what, I, I understand you perfectly. But we must, not be, we must not be ashamed to do that. We must be able to break from that sort of a thing in terms of saying, well, look, we have established empires for thousands of years. We have established all of the disciplines. For thousands of years, but, but therefore, if that is the case, we, without the boat of Mark, can still again understand the whole social structure, the whole book and, you know, the means of production and what have you, without the boat of Mark. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, were you going to say something?